Okay, so we did a practice factoring problem here for reviewing for the final. Uh, and I told the kids that they could use a graphing calculator to check the roots. And we figured out before using that that the roots would probably be uh, 3 or 1 or negative 1 or negative 3. And then we figured out that negative 3 actually works by synthetic. And then here's my final answer. X plus 3. This comes down and makes X plus 3. And that's X to the third plus 2X plus 1. How many of you actually did have that one right? Okay, good. Now, if you wanted to be sure if you were right, if your life depended on it, there are some times. If you're working for NASA, for instance, or one of these new companies like SpaceX, where they're going to have people up in space, and they need to bring them back safely. If you're doing calculations that matter, if you needed to know, you just multiply this puppy back out. You just do first outside, inside, last kind of thing, except you do this one gets multiplied by everything, and then this x gets multiplied by everything, and you would get this back. You multiply it all the way out, and you get the original. So if you need to know if you're right, just multiply it out. Okay, that's a review of the hardest kind of factoring. So what else do you want to know? I'm going to pause for a second while people come up with suggestions from the reviews, the keys, Pause. Okay, so a question has been asked about how do you know if something ends up or down, like the function, is it going up or down on the right and up or down on the left? Let's say it was like this. I know a few things about this graph. The first thing is you look at the one with the biggest degree and you say, is the number in front of that negative? And if it is, that tells me the right side. And if it's negative, you can understand this. It's, it's intuitive. The right side being negative, meaning down. It's down on the right for that function. And then this degree right here, that is an odd degreed function. And therefore, they must be going opposite directions. One's up and one's down. And since this one's got to be going down because of this negative here, this one has to be going up. Now, what else do I know about it? Basically, one other thing. It goes through 7 as it's what, what? Y-intercept. The y-intercept is 7, so it hits like right there. So it goes something like that. Now, do I know it goes exactly like that? No. I could be doing all kinds of things. I'll give you another one that's going, let's say it goes like this, and then might be something like that. Although, let's see, how many roots would that have? 1, 2, that would have 3 roots. That's possible with degree 3. But for the ends anyway, what you asked about was the ends. You look at the lead coefficient. If it's negative, the right side's down. Period. No matter what you anything else says, if it's leading with a negative, it's down on the right. Then to know what it's doing on the left side, you look at this number. And if that's an odd number, they're doing opposite things. If that's an even number, they're going to go the same. Now, if you understood me, everybody try this one, please. Negative 6x to the 5th plus 5x to the 7th. I don't expect you to know exactly what this function is doing, but I expect you to know how it ends and how it begins. You have been misled. Look at the equation more carefully. <laughs> you were also misled. Ah, now some people are noticing. Okay, can you do, draw me a picture because it's easier for me to grade? Just, just, just a quick sketch. You were misled. You are correct, including the y-intercept. Your y-intercept's off a little bit. Everybody look at your y-intercept before you show me the graph. Yes, that's it, including the y-intercept. Yeah. Yup. Yeah. Your y-intercept's off. Where do you find your y-intercept? The y-intercept is where... Finish that sentence. The y-intercept is where? No. Y-intercept is where? X equals zero. Okay. X equals zero. Yes. Close, but you still haven't got your y-intercept at the right spot. Just zero. That's correct. Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, yours is a straight line. This has definitely got a curve in it. you got to throw in at least some curve to it. Yes. Now, wait a minute. No. Nope. Yours would be right if the lead term was actually the lead term. You got fooled. 
good, 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 good. 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 Uh, can you write with a thicker pen? And you got fooled by the lead coefficient because it's not the lead coefficient. Good. All right, here's what people were being fooled by. They were using this the whole time, and you shouldn't have been. Pay attention. So this part gets crossed off. Why? Because this is a bigger degree, and therefore it's the lead coefficient. The lead coefficient is positive, and therefore it's up on the right. It has to be going through what y-intercept? The y-intercept is where x equals 0. If I put a 0 here and here, I get 0. So it's 0. So it has to be going through there. And then it has to be going which way? If it's opposite of that, since it's odd, it's opposite, it's got to be going down. So something like that would have been a good answer. All right. Now, could it have also had an extra few loops in there? Sure. Degree 7 means there could be lots of loops in there. It could be something like this. That's possible. Okay. You'd say the number of turns in the graph could be six turns if it's degree seven. That's what you're going to learn in pre-calc. One, two, three, four, five, six turns, degree seven. Okay. Anyway, it doesn't have to be that way, though, because it could be as simple as this, because there could be imaginary roots that you can't see. So, in other words, you can't always see all the waves and stuff. You can't see all the roots. Sometimes they're imaginary. This one has at least one real root at zero. OK, moving on. Who has another topic? That was a good one, and it was asked in other hours, which shows that it's a good one. Yes? Things with i in them. Excellent. Let's say we had 2i. Could that ever be the answer to a quadratic equation? Nope. What's wrong with it? It's kind of a stretch question. Plus and minus. You always have to have a plus and minus when you get i's. Why? Because they're always in the quadratic formula as plus and minus the square root of blah, blah, blah. So here's a more complicated one. 2 plus and minus the square root of negative 4 all over 2. I'd like you to simplify that all the way down, including the fact that it has an i in the answer. Give that one a try. Compare with the kid sitting next to you. I'll pause for a second while you do that. All right, so on this one, excuse me, some of you guys are talking. Shh. So you go, this gets simplified to 2i. Then notice there's a plus and minus in front of it. 2 plus and minus 2i all over 2. And then the 2s can cancel. 2 goes into all of those once. 1 plus or minus i all over 1. Now, some people think, oh, they just canceled, so they're gone. So the answer is just plus and minus i. Wrong. They cancel, so there's a 1 in all those spots. 1 plus and minus 1i, which is the same as i. And you don't need to say divided by 1, but you do need to have that 1 in the front. Okay, that's a really common mistake for people to think they can cancel off that 1. There's your answer. 1 plus i and 1 minus i. In the back, yes. Okay, so if you have <coughs> this, in my opinion, the I should go in front instead of afterwards. Here's why. There's two reasons. Number one, I made it really clear that the I is not underneath the root. But sometimes kids drift this little long like that, and all of a sudden it looks like the I is underneath the square root, which is a big no-no. Okay, so that'd be wrong. That's one reason I like to have them in the front. The other reason I like to have them in front is that generally, have you ever seen us write square root of 3 times 2 like that, ever? Haven't we always put the square roots at the end and said like 2 square roots of 3? So that's my opinion on why I think the i should go in front. Have you seen them at the end on keys? Yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way I'd like you to put them. Remember, it's a multiple choice test. So you're not going to have to worry about that. They'll be in one spot or the other spot. And it's not like a trick question where you, if you put it at the end, you're wrong. It's just, a, it's just a formality thing. So if the answer on the test says this, and you think that's what you know, the answer is supposed to be, square root of 6i, take it. It's not like it's wrong. It's just I think it'd be better if the i was in front. That's all. OK? Yes, sir. 
Ah, yes. I versus I squared versus all those things. So I is the square root of negative 1. First of all, that's the number one thing you need to know. The number two thing you need to know that's just as important because it comes up on your, uh, on your tests and on your ACT test is that I squared is negative 1. Just negative 1. I don't want to re-explain why all of that happens because it would take me too long. I've, this is a review day, so we need to go fast. But then if you go to I cubed, you can make it up with I squareds and I's. So if you want to go to I cubed or I to the fourth or I to the fifth, you just make them up with this and this. So if I to the third is made up of an I squared times an I, then it's really negative 1 times I, which is just I. You could say square root of negative 1 anytime you say I, but it's best to leave your answer with an I in it. So bottom line is this one would be I squared times I, which is negative 1 times I, which is negative I. Okay, yes, it would have been okay to say the negative of the square root of negative 1, but you really need to simplify that to leave an I in your answer. So I to the third is negative I. I to the fourth is really an I squared times an I squared. And both of those are negative ones. So just be one. And I to the fifth starts the cycle over again. I to the fifth is really an I squared and an I squared and an I. And that is one. And one times I is I. So it's just I. So I to the fifth is an I and that starts our cycle over again and then their next answer would be a negative 1 for i to the 6th and i to the 7th. Would, see what I mean? Okay, but if you know them up to here, you don't have to memorize them. You don't want to memorize them. You want to get the idea that i squareds are negative 1s, and then you can make all of these things have i squareds in them. Yes? Sure. Complete the square. Generally, uh, I'm going to make a... Oh, you mean uh, you have a problem. Go ahead. All right, I first want to do complete the square on a normal problem so you get the idea on normal numbers. x squared plus 4x plus 5. Okay, so complete the square. You move this number over, plus 5 goes over, and then everybody please complete the square from there on the red one. And then I'll show you what the blue one's like in a minute. Try the red one. We're doing complete the square, so when you're done, you'll have vertex form. It'll look like this, except that's not the right answer, of course. Okay, this is the part where you use half and square. Half force two, two squared is four, and minus four. And this part's the perfect square part, and so that's y equals x plus two squared, and then that part right there is plus one. Okay? then the vertex of this puppy would have been negative 2 comma 1 and the axis of symmetry is x equals negative 2. This again is right off the pre-calc review too. So this is something that you also get tested on in pre-calc. It's up there harder. All right, now the one that I was asked originally, the red, the, the blue one, same idea. I just move this minus 1 over and then I do half and square. All right, half of the m is m over 2, and then squared. And then I have to have another one like that right here, except I'm going to actually square it. m squared over 2 squared is 4. This part's the perfect square. That should be a minus there. And now it's y equals, see if you can finish it. Now this one's a little complicated because that 1 at the end, you really would want to change that to four-fourths to make the numbers work nice. Yes, ma'am? Because if this is m over 2 quantity squared, both things have to be squared. The m has to be squared and the 2 has to be squared. Now, could I have just left this as exact copy of this one? Yeah, but then it would be harder to add to that. See what I mean? I made it actually get squared so that it would be easier for those last two numbers to add together. 
these two need to get added together to get our final answer. So what you should have said was x plus, and you always use that as your um, whatever's not, it, before you square it, m over 2. That's why it's another reason why it's good to leave it as a fraction squared, because then you can reach and grab it and put it right here. And then this part here, it's icky because it's got fractions, but really, I just have to say it's the common denominator now of 4, which worked pretty nicely. And then the top is negative m squared minus 4. I could put a plus here, or I could put that minus right there over here if you wanted. Either way could work. All right, that was a complicated one, but it involved lots of little algebra stuff, and that's what I keep telling you. That's why those top 20s are important, because the algebra stuff just still keep coming back. And when I talked to an AP calculus class the other day, that where some of you will be two years from now, I asked their opinion. I said, I've heard that uh, the teachers say that, that, that a lot of this is algebra, and it's not even that much calculus in calculus, and they said, yes. It's all algebra. When they make their mistakes, it's all algebra mistakes. The calculus isn't that hard. It really isn't. It's the algebra. So this kind of stuff, don't be scared of it. Don't just dig into it. Learn it. Figure it out. And th this is what's going to really make the difference on whether or not you can handle calculus is handling the complicated little algebra stuff. That's why I keep pounding on those top 20s, and I think it's paying off. The average on that last test, because I didn't made you do a lot of factoring. You remember? On the top 20s, the first two questions always involve factoring. Um, bottom line, or sorry, the second and the third question involve factoring. The average in this class was a 92% on that test. That's phenomenal. That's awesome. The, the averages are not normally that high on that test. Okay, so you guys did really well as a group. So I'm going to pause the writing for a second. And that's all the time we had for review today. Uh, we are going to be uh, taking that test here over the next few days. Remember to come in in the mornings, you can get extra help. This did not cover anywhere near all the questions. It was just a sample.